So I'm giving the condensed version of software packaging, which I condensed from a, a larger presentation, and I'll, I'll try and condense a little bit more. This is our normal license citation and acknowledgement slides. Um, and in the packaging tutorial, what I'm going to go over kind of the basic steps of, you know, I, as a, as a software team, we've developed a we've developed our software package it's a library it's an executable with some stuff that we want to use as a dependency in another project um, how do we package that what are the guidelines what are the sort of workflows that we can use to go through and i had more walkthroughs in here but i'm just going to stick with the c plus plus code and see make exports uh walk through because i think that'll be pretty instructive so uh, we have kind of a mini cartoon uh sorry for the the graphics resolution, I guess the, um, the image compression isn't your friend, but uh, here's an example of a, of a person, you know, picking up a package with no instructions, not really sure what it does, and it, it turns into a Megazord or something. Um, and this gives you the idea of, let's make sure that we document what's inside the package, how do we use it, what's expected, so that users know what to expect before they open the box, um, and also be aware that too much automation is not always a good thing. Why would we package? Um, standards and conventions save everyone time. Um, there are programming languages that actually have, as, as a part of their programming language, built-in standards like, like Julia and Go um, and, and Rust. They have packaging specifications for how your software can be used as a module inside other people's software. And it's, it helps because if you follow those conventions, you don't have to think too hard about using uh, using upstream, using upstream software, or um, or packaging your software for downstream. So as I go through this tutorial, I'll, I'll give you a kind of a a walkthrough that's based on a, a simple heat equation that I kind of did in multiple different languages. There's some, if you look at this example, um, there's some kind of modular design inside these inside these files. But today I'll talk about the packaging aspect. So. Um, we start from this minimal, I've got a bunch of source code, what do I do with it? There's in here already, kind of as a, as a ground level of um, where do I start from, there's already a, a make file and a CMake list and a build.sh, and all three of those are really in, uh, great signals to people who are looking at your package as to how they're expected to build um, and run this. Um, make file is a little bit redundant with, with CMake lists. It's 100% redundant with CMake lists, um, but it's good, you know, when you're starting to maybe start with a make file and, and add CMake lists as your packaging gets more complex. Guidelines and themes with packaging. Uh, packaging is kind of an additive process. You want to start from something that already has a, a portable build system. Um, make files usually aren't uh, super portable, but CMake lists and auto make are are ways to generate make files that are able to look at the environment of the machine that you're compiling on. And so those help you um, have kind of a, a portable build system that will translate between, that should translate between machines more easily. Um, keep your source and your documentation together because um, in that case, you're, you tend to make modifications to your source and the documentation at the same time. Um, some projects do this and some projects don't. So it, it may depend a little bit on your project culture, but as a general guideline, try and keep those together. Um, also keep your source and your tests together um, so that you're able to um, update those at the same time. And during your uh, pull request and, and review procedures, double check that, that your documentation and your uh, tests have been updated to reflect what's happened in the source code. Some projects maintain separate reference artifact repositories, just as, a, as a kind of a, an exception to this policy. If you've got large you know, gigabyte files that you're using to reference the results of a run, it's probably good to keep that in a separate repository. And so your test would then you know, download the reference artifact and run the test and, and check. Um, split and separately package projects that become large. This is the major advantage of packaging that once, you, uh, once you're good at it and you are able to you know, package your um, package your program and um, import that program from somewhere else, you're able to make your code more modular and kind of separate development concerns even along packaging lines. More do's and don'ts. Um, have a CI level integration test that is one that actually downloads and builds and installs your software and then checks the installed version. Um, so that very high level user experience can be tested and uh, document the manual install process as well. Don't just release a container, um, even though it can be tempting. It's, it's really good to have the steps to run so that someone can install this on their machine themselves. 
because people running in HPC centers don't always have all of the, the nice um, the nice base level stuff that you can get in inside of your advanced or developer systems. Um, another example from a couple of projects that I've worked with is they have in their documentation how to install their dependency libraries. That's important if you're dependent on something like Boost um, or a large uh, finite element toolkit that has lots of configurable options. Um, if you're dependent on some part of Trulinos, explain what parts of Trulinos and how to compile it for your users. Don't assume everyone access, okay, I already talked about this one. I uh, will have access to app get Docker or VMs for getting their dependencies. Also, as you're packaging, think about what the consuming side would look like. And I would encourage you to actually package for yourself. Um, so, so think about, you know, I'm going to package this over here, but then I'm going to, you know, import it and use it in, in another piece of um, application code that I'm writing. Um, and so as an application code, you should expect to be able to kind of complain when something doesn't compile or, or install or run as, as expected um, or documented. And those are vital fixes that the developers should thank you. As a developer and a releaser of packages, you should remember to thank the people who tell you about packaging issues uh, because they are helping uh, everyone else who is going to use your code later. Um, and then if you have, um, as you're running and using your dependencies, if you notice that there's updates they can make to their, doc to their documentation, do that. It's a great way to build communication lines. Um, and this also gets a little bit into where uh, and what to file for bugs. Um, when I first started in HPC, I thought, you know, everything is supposed to work and all these people know what they're doing, but apparently that's not necessarily the case. Um, usually you're one of the few people who is running this code on this system. And so there's kind of a, there's kind of a, a hierarchical group of people that you can involve in your compile and run and development process that kind of starts with your HPC site and facilities colleagues. They want to know what you're running. So if you run into issues, they're kind of your first go-tos to ask, you know, what's the base system and what's the, what's the configure option there? Sometimes there are, um, there are bugs that are inside of your base system that, that those system devs will want to know about. And, um, and then of course, if it's not, the standard contribution policy is if it's not obvious to someone, then we, it should be documented. Um, and then once you have something working and you're able to use your upstreams, then you know, definitely submit that uh, success report and how it worked. All right, so now this will kind of go through the example a little bit, I'll have to rush, but basically once you've built your source code, you're thinking, okay, people will install this in executables, headers and libraries. And I wanna talk about how to kind of put those you know, how to use the standard conventions to put those things where they go on a system when I install. Um, there are also some ways to use the package stack to help you develop so that you can kind of um, install your software and use it as, as part of your testing. Um, I'll just leave that um, as a slide that you can reference if you go to our online materials so that I can get through these things a little bit uh, more quickly. One of the specific complications that CMake helps you with is when you have, um, okay, so this, this is actually supply chain security and this one is transitive build link requirements. So CMake helps you with transitive build link requirements when you have um, multiple packages that have different, um, maybe compiler flag options um, or different, different ways that they need to compile their dependency libraries. CMake can document how those dependency libraries were compiled so that when you build your uh, software, you just have to think about the libraries you directly depend on and not their transitive dependencies. Um, and another thing that's, that's helpful with packaging is it lets you think about uh, supply chain stability and security. Uh, so you can think about, I've released a package, now I have uh, a commit SHA for it and I, I can add signatures to my release. I can make a database of which releases um, I have used as dependencies and check that database in case there are uh, bugs and vulnerabilities. You may have seen like automated announcements from GitHub and it's, it's looking at released versions and then you know, vulnerabilities released for those released that, that have been explained for those released versions. So packaging can help you um, look at your supply chain security. All right, so this is the, the last piece of the, the last major piece of the, the walkthrough for CMake, right? So we had a CMake list.txt before. When you package your library and you want to export it so that others can use it, CMake has this great feature that is called targets. Uh, so CMake can export its target. And when you build it, um, when you build your software, you can say, I require 
um, MPI at a specific, right? So I require MPI at a, a version 2.0. Um, and what happens is if there's a nice CMake target for MPI, then you've just imported that CMake target. I'm building a library in this case, which gives me like a heat equation solver. And that heat equation solver um, goes into a library that's a, a shared object file. And the uh, config.cmake.in on the right-hand side, okay, so on the left-hand side, there are some additions to your CMake list.txt that say copy this, um, right? So there's install, export your heat equation targets um, so, that, so that your downstream dependencies can say, I require heat equation targets. Um, and then the library will be installed and, and in, in your dependencies CMake, they can just say require heat equation. Um, there's also a config.cmake.in, which is another piece um, to this dependency puzzle. This is essentially like the, um, the package config, if you're familiar with automake. This config cmake.in is run by your dependencies when they install your project, right? So there are some, some multi-physics solvers that are going to import my heat equation library. They're all going to run config.cmake.in that I've written here, and they're all going to check that MPI is there. Um, as part of their install process, because it's it's auto magic that happens when they require my target. Okay, so that's kind of the the very fast view through what these uh, CMake um, files give you, but this is the standard way to to install a library with CMake, and I've provided some references and examples, which are the easiest way to to attach this into your project. Um, with that, let me make sure that I stay on time. Oh, I have three more minutes. Great. Um, there's also ways to go one step farther and you know take your your installable and uh, compilable package and then explain to spec how to run your um, how to run your CMake install pro process. For now, um, or for you know just beginning when you're starting off your packaging process, it's probably easiest to include a build.sh file, which is just the one shell line that says run CMake and use dash d cxx compiler equals user bin GCC. Um, SPAC is kind of another way to give those um, CMake config options to CMake. And there's lots of examples out there. Uh, SPAC is well documented um, and, and it's simple to get started. All right, so the net result of adding this packaging here is that we've, um, we've put in more documentation on how users can uh, use the CMake lists. I should have actually put a file over on the right here that's cmake.in, but there's a cmake.in now uh, that I explained to you is, is what downstreams will use to configure themselves to use this uh, package. And there are some tests. Um, write that in your readme, um, add it in your change log, explain how users can now benefit from the, the work that you've done, put into your packaging. Um, let's see, I don't have a huge amount of time left. So I'm going to uh, skip the part of containerization other than to say that um, when you're building a container, what you're basically doing is you're starting with a preformed image that's kind of your base image. You install packages into it, and then you provide a recipe that, that mimics what the user does. They copy the source of your, your, your package, and they run the install process, and it, it builds inside of this container. All right. Um, so in conclusion, uh, there's a lot of do's and don'ts for packaging here. Uh, documentation is is number one. If you can document it, um, you definitely should. And um, packaging helps you interact with your users, and it's a tool to kind of couple um, couple codes and put them into modular format a little bit better. Thanks. Like there's any questions online yet? Is are there any questions in the room? Always hungry for lunch. We are going to continue with the tutorial after lunch at one o'clock. So if any questions kind of bubble up during lunch, um, feel free to ask during that time as well. Um, let's give a round of applause and a thank you for all of our instructors for today. Um, We'll reconvene in about an hour. Thank you.
So we're going to go ahead and get started again. Um, we're going to continue on with part three of three of the Better Scientific Software tutorial. Are there more slides on this one or should I, do we need to switch presentations to the um, testing? Next presentation on testing. 